Morning, church. Is it morning? What is the time by your watch? It is afternoon. Good afternoon, church. How are you doing? How was your week? Some the week was good. Some the week was bad. But all of us, we are in the house of God rejoicing because of the many blessings that he has given us. You know, when you are doing something which is for the glory of God, sometimes the devil is not happy. 
And when he's not happy, he will make sure that uh, things are not working the way you think. As the choir was singing, I loved the song. And I pray that you were singing together with them the message they were saying that it is a time that we need, when you have received the light, you need to come out of the darkness and do as the light is uh, all about. I want to tell you of a story before I begin the sermon for today. There was a, a woman in the city of uh, the city which is found in uh, Indiana. This woman lived in the year 1940s. When she was living in the 1940s, she had a husband and their wife, they were living together. And they were blessed to have a child, a boy. And I want to name the child to be called uh, Evans, the way I can say. When they were living together, things became so tough. Life became so unbearable to the point that they were fighting each other. They were calling each other names. They were, doing, they were not doing things the way they were supposed to be, as many of us face as we are living in this world. When things were not the way they were supposed to be, the man said, enough is enough. I have to quit this life because it was not meant for me. The woman tried to tell the husband, you know, life is unbearable, but said a soldier on. The man said, no, enough is enough. I have to go. The man went. The boy even was growing and is going to school. He met his friends in school and the teachers in school. When the children are being told to say about their parents, each children was saying to parents, but when it came to him, he was asking myself, what can I say because I don't have a father. What can I say? When his time came, he said, I am so and so, and my father is not there. Then all the children laughed at him. Then he asked himself, should I continue living like this where other children are laughing at me? She went home with bitterness, very bitter, to ask the mother why the father is not there. Then the mother started crying, asking God, why? Why am I like this? Who can stand in for to be the father of my son because he's giving me trouble every now and again. He's giving me a challenge every now and again. I have no answer about it. Why is this happening? The mother prayed for the boy and told him, you know, it is what it is. There is nothing I can do. The son went to school again. The, the journey continued like that every now and again, every now and again, every now and again, until the boy was almost quitting life. But still, the mother kept on telling the boy, you know, don't do anything. God loves us. God takes care of us. I thought of this story. I said today is men's day. I was asking myself, has that happened to you? Has that happened to you? Let's pray. Father God, we come before your presence. We want to speak and listen to you. Father, come down and talk to us. And know that we really need your message this afternoon. And the message that you want to speak to us, now bring it before our minds. I'm standing here. I'm not what Lord to speak before your children, but I believe that through your Holy Spirit, 
I'm able to speak what you want me to speak. Lord, put me the words that you want me to speak before your children and make it to be known before them if it so pleases you that, Lord, it may settle in their hearts so that they can be able to remember them and keep them and use them for your own glory because you have prayed all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The topic for today is about God is looking for the man. Remember, the whole of this week for those who joined the Zoom meeting, you heard every man who was speaking in the evening, they were talking about how God is looking for a man. Just as the story I've finished, the woman, the, the boy was looking for the father, who is the what? The man. The same way, even in the church today, God is looking for the man who can be able to stand and do God's will. I thank God I saw many men standing here, man, and I was very impressed. But now the question when it comes to the service in the house of the Lord, where is the man? Where is the man? That is the question. Remember, the beginning of the week, we said that when God created man, he created man in his own image and his, in, in his what? In his own likeness. The Bible tells us that they said, let us create man in our own what? In our own image. I want you today to put yourself as we speak with one another. When God is speaking to us, you look at that scenario that you are created in the image of God and in his likeness. And it didn't end there. He put man to do something because how can you create somebody and leave him just like that? You have to give him responsibility. He gave him responsibility on what he was to do. And they put him in the Garden of Eden. When he put him there, he told him what he was supposed to do, which means he gave man responsibility. As you all know, in the church of KCC, as men, when we come, we have a responsibility. Also, God gave man what responsibility. The first person to give responsibility was who? Man. He never gave man women responsibility, though. I'm sorry to say that. He gave man responsibility to, 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 to bring it down to the woman. That's what exactly he did. The same way, as we continue to live in this world, you know, the, allow me to say this. The culture of this world is very dynamic in a way that men nowadays have been so shortchanged. I'm not fearing to say that because it's true. Now the position that was meant for the men to do, it's not done by them, it's done by who? Women. That was not the agreement of God right from the beginning because men were supposed to take up the responsibility that was to be done by them, nobody else. There is no way out you can shortchange what God did. He said, man first, then second, what? God. Because God saw the, man saw the world first than a woman. Is it true? Yes, that is how it was. So when man was given responsibility, he was to do it with due diligence, with faithfulness, even when woman sinned in the Garden of Eden, because to me I read, I know that woman was the first, first person to sin. When the woman sinned, who is being asked? The man. Because he was given responsibility. When things go wrong in the house of the Lord, who is supposed to be asked? It's not pastor. It's not the elders of the church. It's the man. Who is the man? It is me and you. That is a reality. So when we do that, you ask yourself, am I worth living? That is the question sometimes I ask myself. If I am not doing the responsibility that God gave me to do, why am I living? Why do I want to live tomorrow and the days to come if I am not doing the responsibility that God gave me to do. That's why God was in the business, he's in the business now of searching for who? Amen. I like what the Bible, in the book of Ezekiel, what it was saying. Of course, I'm going to talk about it down there. 
the Bible was saying, I want to read, to read it loud before us. It was saying, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but found none. Was there men in the, in the time of the prophet Ezekiel? Yes, they were. But was there anyone found? We will, we will talk about it. The whole week we saw that the kind of men God was looking for, men who, men who will be true to him and the promises they have made to him. When we began our Christian journey, we began with a decision we made in our lives with a promise to God. We will follow him the rest of our lives. I made a promise. You made a promise. All of us made a promise that from today, when I have turned from the world, whatever I have been doing, I am stopping them. I am giving them a back. I want to follow what God wants me to do. We said, I will keep the promise. Do you keep the promise? Because when you keep the promise, you still continue doing the beginning of what you said you want to do. Some of us give accusations. The question is, how often do we make promises to God? And how often do we keep them as men, as women now, as children, as everybody in the house of the Lord? How, do, how often do we keep the promises? How often we fail and God, how often we fail God because we are not true to our own words? We are not true even to ourselves. Have you ever seen a person who is not true to himself? It is us human beings. Sometimes we do not understand ourselves. You say this today, tomorrow you do a different thing. You say this now, as you walk out this door, you do something different. That is how we are as the nature of human beings. We practice what we are not even saying. Because we do not understand ourselves. We fail our God. We do not fail men and women whom we see, but we fail who? Our God. I don't fail myself. I fail who? I fail God. When I do not do what God expects me to do, I fail God. So the greatest problem we have is practicing what we preach or what we say. That is the, the number one key thing. Because we know we are supposed to be the doers of the word and we are supposed to follow it to the very end as the children of God. Remember, the eyes of God or the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro throughout the world. That is why he's able to seek and see who is the man who is standing before him who is able to do what he commands him to do. The book is Second Chronicles chapter 16, verses 9. The Bible says... For the eyes of the Lord ran to from throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of those who, whose heart is loyal to him. God is always looking for the people who are loyal to him, who can be able to stand before him, who can be able to do what is his will. He says God is looking for a man. I'm talking about what we discussed for the whole week. God is looking for the men who have yielded their hearts, who have yielded to their Christ, their Savior, who have yielded to the Redeemer, who wants to follow him to the very end, and who will lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares them, who are ready to die for the truth, who are ready to walk the path that God expects them to walk. Everywhere men who are Christians always talk about like, the coming of the Lord is at the hand. But do we show that we are living like that? Remember, we are supposed to sacrifice our talents, our time. I like a statement when I was preparing myself to speak today. The statement which was written by Winston Churchill when he was uh, observing men, he stood, as I have stood before you guys this afternoon, he was observing men and they said, 
men occasionally stumble over the truth. But most of them pick themselves up and they hurry off as if nothing has happened. And they repeat. Men occasionally stumble over truth. But most of them pick themselves up and they hurry off as if nothing has happened. I hope it's you. It is me. When you stumble about the truth, when you realize that what you are doing is not the truth, and you say, okay, I've done this, it's not the truth. I want today to go to the book of Ezekiel, and the chapter is 22. And I want us to read from verse 1. Then go downwards, we see the man that we were talking about, what happened to them. The reason as to why God is asking who can be able to stand for us, who can be able to speak for us, who can be able to make me not to finish these people. I want to see what the Bible says. Let us go there. The book is Ezekiel, and the chapter is 22, and the first is uh, 1, and the Bible says this. This is why, remember, the reason as to why God is sending Ezekiel to the people. He's sending and declaring to them judgment. And he's sending a stern warning. He was sending a stern warning to the people of Judah and to the people of, who are living in Jerusalem. And he was sending him so that he can deliver to them a message about their sins, about their transgressions, so that they can be able to see the judgment that is coming before them. You know, most of the time, when we study the word of God, it gives us judgment. Some of us are quick to judge the other people. Some of them are quick to talk about the other people. Maybe, maybe when I'm standing like this, somebody is talking about me. That is the nature of human beings. The same way it was that time. When Ezekiel came, things were out of hand. It was very easy to talk about the other person. It was very easy to orchestrate something to finish someone in his life. I think you guys have seen politicians. Like now, it's an electioneering period in the U.S. When you see a politician stand, he's talking about finishing the other person so that he can be able to look better than who? Than the other person. The same way the people in that time were like that. They were ready. If it's killing, it's killing so that they can proceed with their intentions. The Bible says, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, and you son of man, will you charge? Will you charge the bloody city? Then inform her of her, all her abominations. And you shall say, now God is saying this, and you shall say, after God instructed Ezekiel, he says this, and you, you shall say, this is what the Lord God says, a city shedding blood in her midst, so that her time is coming, a city that makes idols contrary to her own good for defilement. You have become guilty by the blood which you have shed. You have become defiled by your idols which you have made. So you have brought your days closer and you have come to your years. Therefore, I have made you a disgrace to the nations and an object of mocking to all the lands. Those who are near and those who are far from you will make fun of you and, 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 and fun of you, you of ill repute, full of turmoil. Remember, when we look at verse 1 through verse 16, it talks about God sitting as a judge. And where is he sitting from? He's sitting from heaven. And in his bench, and Jerusalem, and the people of Judea are like prisoners before him at the bar. 
the prophet is sent and authorized to charge the bloody city because Jerusalem had a peculiar bloodshed schemes which are performed before him. Their crimes were bloody. Crimes in general, which they did, they polluted even themselves. They polluted even the land. It was unhospitable. It made them to receive the blood to drink. Now God was to convict them of their sins and of their crimes which they committed and to pass a sentence over them. Now, what did Ezekiel do? Ezekiel was to find the mistakes and to find the children of Israel, more especially those who are living in Jerusalem and Judah, how culpable they were because of the sins they committed. And the judgment that they were to receive, remember the judgment they were to receive, it was so that those ones who will be able to see the judgment that has been made to them, they can be able to change and do the will of God. Now, what are the sins they committed? Do you know you cannot be charged without knowing what you have committed? They committed sin, which they were supposed to be charged of. And these sins were exceedingly, the book of Ezekiel tells us that they were exceedingly sinful. They didn't deserve to be forgiven. That's why God came and wanted to prove to them that this is what you have done. Number one, they were murderers. They shed blood by killing innocent people. They were unpardonable. I like this statement. They were unpardonable. They were, the way they were not forgiving those who wronged them, they went ahead to finish them is the same way they were finished. Can I ask you a question, church, this afternoon? Do we forgive our brothers and sisters who sin to us? The same way they were, they were not forgiving. The way we do not forgive, they were counted as murderers. They carried tails to shed blood. They tried to make things that can be able to kill the children of God by lying about them. As the guilt of the city was increased, the numbers of those that should have stood in the gap to turn away the wrath of God, they were nowhere. They were nowhere. They were diminishing each day. Second sin was idolatry. They polluted themselves by worshipping other gods. And even they went ahead to give sacrifices to those gods. Their mind and conscience was defiled and them there was nothing pure coming out of them. Those who did not make idols were dining with those who had idols and had constant communication with those who were idolaters. And they, they, they could not see anything. They were conspiring in every way doing what was evil. They were disobedient to the parents. They were disobedient even to to, to, to each and every one of themselves. They were opp oppressors and they were extortioners. Why? They did so so that they can be able to enrich themselves. When they found strangers, I like this statement. When they found strangers, they took advantage of their necessities and his ignorance of the laws and the customs of the country where in Jerusalem, so that they can be able to oppress them. Number five, of which number five is one of the things that is affecting us so much, even us. There was the profanation of the Sabbath and other holy things. They despised the, the rights God gave them. They taught them plain to ordinary, and they despised them. And they followed the customs of the world. They were not teaching what they were required. They were not teaching the word of God the way it's supposed to be taught. They followed other things. I like what happened to them. 
Now God passed a sentence to them. He, he told them this through Ezekiel. Let her know that she has filled up the measure of the iniquity and their sin are such as forbid delays and calls for speedy features. Number two, let her know that she has exposed herself and God has exposed her justly to the contempt and the scorn of all our neighbors. You know, some of us, when we sin, sometimes, do you think the devil is divided by himself? The devil is not divided. He makes us sin and sin. Then he, it's, he exposes us before our friends. Then when he exposes us before our friends, they, our friends will expose us to the rest of the community. And when the community sees us, what will they see? They see a rotten people. The same way God told them, I will expose them what they have done for me. I will show it to their neighbors who thought they can be able to see good things from them. Then he says, those who know us, God has exposed them who, who are before them. They mock us. How we are claiming to be Christians but doing evil. We are mocked because of our sins which are scandalous. Number three, let her know that God is displeased, highly displeased at her wickedness and does and witness against it. Let her know that proud and secure as she is, she is no match for God's judgment. She is assured that the destruction she has deserved will come. God continued to tell them that. When they were told like that, some of us, them didn't know, did not turn. Remember, when God brings his own people into the furnace, he sits by them. As the refiner by his gold, to see that they be not con continued there any longer than is fitting and needful. But he will bring those people into the furnace as men throws draws into it, which they design shall be consumers, shall be consumed, and there will be no doubt or there will be no care about it. When you look at verses uh, 17 through 22, you find that when God put somebody to be refined, he never goes away from there. He sits there so that he can refine these people. When he refines these people, he wants them to change. He wants to, them to know him. He wants them to know where they have gone wrong so that they can be able to come back. Now the question is, did the Israelites deserve the judgment? Do we deserve judgment by God because of what we have done? Israel deserved the judgment. It needed this judgment for refinement. Sometimes we face things in our lives. We ask ourselves why we are facing this as men. Sometimes we don't understand where we are facing them. But it is because God wants us to be refined as his children. I like this statement. Men have used means and the methods of reformation. But this means and the method of reformation has not proved to be effectual or effective. What God do now? God will withhold something from us if we do not change as his children. That's why men, I'm calling you today. As we stood here, let us stand in the house of God. Let us do God's will. And let us do it. Let us not do it so that other people to see us. Let us do it so that God can be able to see us who created us in his image and in his own likeness. Let us not leave women to do the job that we were supposed to do. Let us do it. Sometimes women will mock us. I'm sorry to say that. 
They will mock us, yes. But as a man stand and do the work God has given us. Remember, a change was drawn to those expected to warn the people of their sins. But they never did. And they helped the people to feel the measure of the nation's guilt. When you stand back and see things are not going okay because you are being scorned, remember a measure of the portion of what you are doing will come. When that measure is coming, where will you stand as a child of God? Remember when I was studying my Bible, I found that even those who were supposed to warn the people, even those who were supposed to teach the people what was right, they were not doing it. They were conniving with those ones who were doing wrong. And they were, because they were getting some portions of things from them, they were doing wrong. The prophets. Look at the prophets during the time of Ahab and Rahab. What did the prophets do? They were prophesying against the righteous people so that the king could do what? Protect them. My brother, my sisters, when you see something is done wrong, when you see me doing wrong, are you able to stand and tell me that you are doing wrong? You need to stop. Or because I share with you the spoils I get every now and again, and you are my friend, you will defend me. Most of the time, we defend our friends because they come for us in the time of need. That was that time. It was there like that. Because you come at the point when I need you, because you stand for me at the time when I need you, when I do wrong, you don't need to say. Somebody who is not doing wrong, you will stand in to say wrong things about this person, of which is not true, so that this person can be persecuted the same way they did. Those who could have been the brightest example of virtue, we have, they, they became the ringleaders of iniquity and the patterns of vice, and we, they corrupted themselves on their own ways. That is what happened during the time of Ezekiel. Things never worked. What did the prophets do? They pretended to make known the minds of God to them. But they became deceivers and hardened the people in their wickedness, both by their preaching. They promised them in purity and prosperity, and their conversations were profligate. They conspired together to sing one song. Remember, birds of the same feather, they do what? They flock together. The way if I am evil, those who are my followers, they will be doing what? They will be evil. I remember the statement I read about uh, Aaron White. I can't, re I can't remember exactly these testimonies for the church for in five. It was saying the river cannot outflow its what? It is source. Have you ever seen a river outflowing its source? Have you ever seen? So one thing as the children of God we need to know is this. As I am, those who are following me will be the same the way I'm doing what? I am. As a leader, how are, you how are you making your people to follow you? The prophets were pretending to make known the minds of God to the people, but they were doing the opposite. They were doing to please those who are doing the wrong things. Of course, I talked about the example of Ahab's prophets. They assured them of peace in their sinful nature. They told them about how they will prosper while they were doing wrong. The, the prophets protected the murderers, the oppressors. They protected them, them in their wicked ways and justify what they did with their false prophecies. This provides an example that we as the children of God men and women, we need to stand. We need to stand in the gap so that our God can save many in this world. We need to stand. Remember that song we sang? The song is uh, 359. If you cannot speak like Paul, 
you cannot speak like angels. You can do whatever you can so that you can make others to know who? To know Christ in your community, in your life. How have you made somebody to know Christ? As a man, how have you made known for Christ? And I want to give an example. I was pleased to see men standing here. We were like more than 50. And I pray that God can be able to help us to continue standing every day, to continue taking responsibility every day as the 50 men. Because if we do that, the house of the Lord can be vibrant. The house of God can be able to stand. But the only thing that is needed from these 50 men, 60, 70, is us to stand by the truth and live by it. Even if you are being scorned, you are being talked about, you become the talk of the community, you become the talk of the society, you need to stand as a man. You need to follow God to the very end. That is what God requires me, requires of you. Because there is no responsibility that a man was given will be able to be given to a woman. I'm sorry, it will never. God will not shortchange himself. God was true to himself to the very end. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say this, my brother, my sisters. That even the priests who were teachers of office and had the custody of the sacred things and should have called the false prophet to account that they were as bad as the, they, they, they were as bad as the prophet. Look at that. The preachers, the elders, the deacon and the deaconesses, let me put those ones now in. Those who are supposed to teach us what is the truth, they are not teaching us the truth anymore. They have bought the idea of what we are doing which is wrong and they are very happy in that because they want to keep numbers. God is not a God of numbers. God is a God who wants a man, a woman, who stands by the principle of the truth to the very end. That is what God wants us to do as his children when we are living in this world. He doesn't want us to please anybody because they are doing whatever they are doing, which we are happy about. He wants us to account for every mistake that we are doing as the children of God. So priests who are teachers of the office, if you are a teacher of the office that you are holding as a man, you need to stand to teach the truth to the very end. Even the princes, they violated the law of God, which they should have observed and thought to be observed. They blocked the, ro the rose of the priesthood. We are, we, uh, I'm very sorry by this one, though. Remember the example of Hophni and Phineas. They were charged by God to teach the truth. But did, did they teach the truth? They never taught the truth. We have been charged for those ones of us who have been given responsibility. For those ones who stand here at the Purupi to teach. We have been charged with this responsibility to teach the truth. Even if you stand by yourself, you need to teach the truth. You need to teach the truth. That's what, required, what, what is required of us. Their duty was to teach to the people the law of God. Our duty now is to teach the people the law of God. As it is. The, the other thing they did, this one sometimes I find, I find myself in. But I have to say it anyway because I'm a Calvary. Profane, they profaned God's holy things about which they were to minister and of which they could have restrained others from the profanation or the destruction of them. People ate from holy things who are not to do so. The table of the Lord was contemptible with unholy an, an, an hands. My brother, my sister, do we regard the house of the Lord to be the house of the Lord? Where we speak what is holy, where we do what is holy, where if, if we see the pew which is used in the house of the Lord, if it is not correct, we make it to be correct. If we see the house of the Lord is not the way it's supposed to be, we say, okay, this is the work of the deacon and the deaconesses. This is not part of me. You know, sometimes I pity myself because when I, 
I walk around, I see the boat lying down on the floor in the house of the Lord. I walk and leave it just like that. I say, that is the responsibility of the person who's, who's judged to do that. It's not the responsibility of the person who is charged to do that. It's the responsibility of me and you. Remember, the things in the house of the Lord, they are what? Holy. The holiness change. And may I ask a question? The holiness changed in the house of the Lord. Did it change? The holiness in the house of the Lord remains the same. Remains the same. That is why when God was creating each and every day, the things which he created were what? Very good. And they were holy. The house of the Lord needs to be holy. We need to know that the house of the Lord, it is not a social club. It's not a lecture hall. It has not turned, turned down to be a lecture hall. It is a house of the Lord where we want to serve him with a purpose, where we want to do what is expected to be done. When we stand here, I used to know, I used to, 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 to remember those days. I'm almost done. I used to remember those days when we were growing up. There is a message that was written in a, one of the churches where I used to go. That guard your feet when you do what? When you enter. I don't know whether that statement is true to now. Because that's what the book of Isaiah says. To guard your feet when you enter into the house of who? Into the house of the Lord. But do we guard our feet when we enter into the house of the Lord as men and women, children alike? God wants me and you to, to know that the things which are holy need to be holy and it will remain like that to the very end. What did the priests do? They did not put a difference, nor did they teach the people to show the difference between the holy and the profane, the clean and the unclean. They did not ex exu exude those from God is courts who were exuded by the law, nor teach the people to observe the difference of the law. Now, they forgot about the Sabbaths of the Lord, and they were not following. You know, when a leader, you don't follow what the Sabbath says, what will the followers do? When you don't come to Sabbath school in the morning, I'm sorry because I love Sabbath school so much. When you don't come to Sabbath school in the morning as a leader, what will the followers do? When you come to church every Sabbath in the morning, what will your followers do? They will not come. So as a leader, as a leader, as a teacher, as a, as a head of the family, now let me call it. You know, we, are, we, we have two heads. How many heads do we have? Who says one? We have two. One, we have Christ. The second one is what? If you find another, you just tell me. Tell me where it's written in the Bible if you find one. We have only two heads. One is the head of the church. Another one is the head of what? The family. If I don't teach that, then I'm wrong. I'm wrong in this way. I'm following what the culture of this world is teaching us. And that is what God is directing us to come out of it. When we come out of it, we can be able to stand as the children of God. And if you find that as a man, you are not regarded as uh, the head of your house and you are, not being, you are being scorned, pray. Because, yeah, that is the only thing you can do. Pray. God will lead you. God will guide you. And there is no way, by the way, you can be able to lead with a ease, though. You will get persecution. What was the lesson telling us in the morning? Persecution is there. But the end of it, there is brightness. There is joy. You need to stand as a man and know that God needs to count you. Not men to count, other men to count you. Not women to count you. Not anybody else to count you. You need to stand as men so that God can count you. So that God can save cases. So that God can, can save the whole world. Remember, once you do that, God will be 
be able to be happy about you. Let's turn out to that key first that we read in the morning. Who remembers the key first we read in the morning? Yes, let's turn there. I, I, I want us all of us to read to shout it what it says. If you have found it, let us read all of us in the presence of God. What does the Bible say in that verse? In your fashion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did God find anyone? Why? God did not find anyone. Because if you look at the, 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 the things that Ezekiel has written in the chapter 22, those were the things which were in the man. Are those things in our lives today? Oh yes, they are in the midst of us. Now, why is Ezekiel calling to our attention this afternoon? He's calling to our attention this afternoon that if one man can be found standing faithful, can stand before the hedge, or can stand before the gap, God will do what? God will save us. Remember, he says that I searched for a man among them who could, who, who could build up a wall and stand in the gap before me for the land, so that I could not destroy it, but I found none. God is in the business still. He was in the business in the Garden of Eden. He found a man, but he found a man who is a sinner. He's in the same business of looking for a man now. He's, he has found now a man again who is what? A sinner. But I pray because of Christ who came and died at the cross, because he found the man now, he needs the man to come back to him. He needs the man to seek for the forgiveness of sins that he has committed as, uh, uh, unto him. Remember the book of uh, John chapter 3, verses 16. What does the Bible say? That is where we are now. When we have been found that we are sinful before the eyes of God. When we have been found that we are not teaching what God requires us to teach. We want now to go back to that book of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Remember this is the only world that God has given us. There is no any other world that he has given us. Because that was the first home for what? For man. So that when we have sinned, we need to come back to him. We need to talk to him back. Because he wanted somebody who can be able to intercede. Remember when uh, Abraham heard that Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be on fire. Because God was mad with the people. What did Abraham do? He remembered his lot. His nephew lot. When he remembered his nephew Lot, what did he do? He went ahead to challenge God on the behalf of what? His nephew. Do you think he was challenging God because of uh, those people in Sodom and Gomorrah? No. He was challenging him because of who he remembered his what? His kin. My brother, my sister. When you see me, when you see others sinning before the eyes of and you know very well that ahead of us, there is judgment. What are, you going, what are you doing? Are you putting your knees down before me and saying, you know what? My brother Dan, who is standing before there to preach every Sabbath, he is sinning every day. Let me put him before God so that he can be able to live true to the words he's teaching the people. That is the question you need to ask yourself. Are you interceding for me every now and again? Are you interceding for pastor every now and again when he's preaching before us? Are you interceding for the elders? Are you interceding for the deacon and the deaconesses who have been charged to be the res responsible for the house of the Lord? Even a leader who is leading you, wherever is leading you, are you responsible to intercede for him so that he can be able to lead the way God requires? Finally, as the choir comes here to sing for us, I will end by saying this. 
I'm done. I know people are angry. I will end by saying this. God is in the business of looking for a man who can stand to make other sin, to make the sins of the other people to be washed out. Are you the one? Will I be the one? That is the question we need to ask ourselves. The thing I charge men of KCC today is this. Let us stand as men right from now to the very end. Let us, to be, let us be the forefront of serving God as it was right from the beginning when God gave us the responsibility in the Garden of Eden. Let us not sit back and say, let them lead us. Let them say, let them, let them, I'm sorry to say this, let women lead us. It is their time. No, it is your time to stand up as men because you are given the responsibility do the will of God. May God help us to realize that we need to come back to him. May God bless us all.